we're very proud of, I must tell you. Because Bidenomics is working. It's working, Bidenomics. Bidenomics. And Bidenomics is working. All of this is part of our movement together. For what America can be. This is Bidenomics. Bidenomics. <laughs> And we are very proud of Bidenomics. <laughs> Hi folks, this is Peter Boykin and this is Hashtag Go Right with Peter Boykin. We've got a lot of news to talk about. We're staying on the top of, of Kamala Harris today because she's apparently the person we got to beat in 2024. <laughs> we'll be right back. I think it's time for us to go right. for the consequences of our future president not liking my Indian food. Can I just tell you something? Yeah. I've never made dosas. And today we are cooking, but we have a very special guest. Very special. Senator Kamala Harris. Hi guys. Wait, so here's what I want to know. Okay. okay, so what we're going to cook today okay. is well, an Indian recipe. Yes. Because yes. you are Indian. Yes, yes. Okay, and okay. I don't know that everybody knows that, but I find that wherever I go and I see Indian people, the uh -huh. supermarket, on uh -huh. the street, everyone's like, you know Kamala Harris is Indian, right? It's like our <laughs> thing we're so excited about to have you running for president. Yeah. So we're both Indian, yes. but actually we're both South Indian. Yes, um, you look we, like the entire ha one half of my family. Okay, thank you. You do. I've been telling people you we're do. related already, yeah. so this is uh -huh. perfect. It's basically <laughs> true. Uh, and so were you raised eating South Indian food? South Indian food, lots of rice and yogurt, potato curry, dal, lots of dal, idli. Yes, idli. Mm. That's um, a deep cut. <laughs> I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much, and she was always of Indian heritage, and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black, and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a historically black one. college. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn, and she went, she became a black person. Just to be clear, sir, do and you I believe think, that she I think she somebody is should look into that, too, when you ask a continue in a very hostile, nasty tone. It's a direct question, sir. Do you believe that Vice President Kamala Harris is a DEI hire, as I, some Republicans have said? I really don't said. know. I mean, I really don't know. Could be, could be. There are some, and there are. The former president's comments yesterday to the National Association of Black Journalists, where he said that Vice President Harris is, quote, all of a sudden black. As a father of three biracial children, did those comments give you pause at all? They don't give me pause at all. Look, all he said that is that Kamala Harris is a chameleon. She goes to Georgia two days ago. She was raised in Canada. She puts on a fake Southern accent. She is everything to everybody, and she pretends to be somebody different depending on which audience she's in front of. I think it's totally reasonable for the president to call that out, and that's all he did. I mean, look, she's running as a tough-on-crime prosecutor, even though she implemented open border policy. She's saying that she wants to support the police, yet she wanted to defund the police just three years ago. It's totally reasonable to call out the fact that she pretends to be somebody different depending on the audience she's talking to. Democratic Party has rallied behind Kamala Harris as the presidential nominee. In a surprising turn of events, Vice President Kamala Harris has quickly gained overwhelming support among Democrats. With a recent poll revealing that 8 in 10 Democrats are satisfied with her candidacy for president. Now remember, this is the same Kamala Harris that had hardly any faith when she was running for president to begin with. Now this data comes from a survey conducted by the Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs research following President Joe Biden's withdrawal from the race. 
Again, I don't like polls. I think that they change too much to be considered in reality fact, but this is what we can go for for today at this little snapshot. The you know, the enthusiasm for Harris is particularly notable given the party's earlier lukewarm response to Biden. A separate poll conducted before Biden's withdrawal showed that only 4 in 10 Democrats felt somewhat or very satisfied with him as the likely nominee. The stark contrast highlights the rapid shift in sentiment within the Democratic Party, indicating a strong coalescence around Harris. Because at this point, it was like, anybody but Biden, please give us a viable candidate, you know, somebody that we can get behind, and that's what they're doing. Now, this is all much of a surprise with the widespread satisfaction considering that Democrats who complain about the, quote, Democrat process being stolen all the time were, quote, actually deprived of their right to vote for their own candidate. But she didn't get voted in, really. They didn't do a primary that had her name on the ballot. This is just a torch passed down. Now, this is a large concern over the party's internal democratic processes. Although we can remember and draw a parallel to this party's uh, broad acceptance of COVID-19 boosters, which basically has shown that when it comes down to it, there's quite literally a lack of protest or critical engagement or critical thinking within the Democratic Party. It's just tag along. Of course, to be honest, this viewpoint reflects a broader criticism and skepticism, which is clearly opinion-based by me and many others. Now, critics of Harris argue that her nomination represents a continuation of the same issues seen in the past nearly four years under the current administration with Joe Biden. As the vice president, Harris has been a central figure in the administration and is criticized for its handling of the economy, crime, and border security. Remember, she's supposed to be the border czar. Detractors claim that, quote, Bidenomics and failed policies have harmed the nation, undermining what they view as the progress made under former President Donald Trump. We assert, or they assert, that Trump would have kept the country on a better path, whereas Biden and Harris have destroyed it all. Now, these critics are skeptical of any real change with Harris at the helm, emphasizing that she has been a staunch supporter of President Biden, even declaring him fit for the job until his recent exit from the race. Remember, we did it, Joe. There is speculation that significant financial pressure from large donors within the Democratic Party played a lot in Biden's departure, suggesting a calculated move rather than a genuine shift in leadership vision. This criticism highlights concerns about the authenticity of the party's leadership and its direction moving forward. Buyer beware, people. As the nation approaches the next election cycle, the support for Kamala Harris within the Democratic Party will be a key factor to watch, especially as it contrasts with the Republican perspective on leadership and governance. In our constitutional republic, all voices have the opportunity to be heard, and the coming months will test whether the Democrats can maintain their unity and convert it into an electoral success. And God ho hope not. In summary, while the Democratic Party seems to be rallying behind Kamala Harris, the broader implications for the general election remain to be seen. The party's ability to address internal criticisms and present a compelling vision to voters will be crucial in determining their success. This is hashtag go right with Peter Boykin. We're going to continue on. The controversial floating barriers known as the Rio Grande border buoys in Eagle Pass can stay in the water for now. That decision from a federal appeals court that came last night. Ken Molestina explaining why Governor Abbott is now claiming this is a victory and why those who want it removed vow to keep on fighting. 
This is the floating barrier made up of large orange spheres or buoys installed by Governor Greg Abbott and intended to deter illegal border crossings. It's about the length of three football fields and it's been sitting in the Rio Grande and Eagle Pass for more than a year. Now, after lawsuits over its legality, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals says they can stay. Am I upset about this decision? Yeah, I am very upset uh, because the reality is uh, it's just a ploy. It's just a political stunt. Jesse Fuentes is with the Eagle Pass Border Coalition and owns a small river tour company in the area. He was the first to sue before the Biden administration jumped on board with the effort. What do you think is the next step for you all now, legally, now that it's been uh, decided that they could stay? I have a feeling that we will send this to, uh, to the Supreme Court. Eventually, it's going to get to the Supreme Court. And, I mean, there's president there, hundreds of years of president that protects that river. While Fuentes vows to keep pushing for yet another appeal, Governor Greg Abbott responded in a statement calling this a victory over the Biden administration and a win for his efforts to secure the border. He said, quote, we fought to keep these barriers in the water, and with the Fifth Circuit's decision, that is exactly where they will remain. This fight is far from over. Fuentes says as long as the buoys stay there, the natural ecosystem will suffer. They've uh, obstructed the flow of water. They've uh, collected sediment and debris. They're forming an island. They're coming apart at the seams. Ken Molestina, CBS News, Texas. And we should note that the trial to ultimately decide the future of the border buoys, barring uh, appeals, of course, is, uh, regarding the Rio Grande, is scheduled to begin Tuesday of next week in Austin, and we'll be covering it for you. So Texas has secured a broader, a border, not a broader, a border victory over the Biden-Harris administration. Finally. In a significant ruling, the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals has allowed Texas to keep a floating barrier in the Rio Grande. This decision comes as a victory for the state against the Biden-Harris administration, which has sought to remove the barrier. The barrier designed to deter illegal immigration from Mexico stretches the length of three soccer fields and is anchored by concrete in Eagle Pass, Texas. This area has been a notable hotspot for border crossings. Now, Texas Governor Greg Abbott expressed his approval on social media, stating, quote, Last night, the Fifth Circuit ruled that Texas can keep our boys in the Rio Grande. The Biden-Harris administration sued to remove them and instruct our orders and efforts to in- secure our border. Instead, Texas won. Texas won. We will never back down in our fight to secure our border. Abbott's statement underscores Texas' commitment to boistering border security, a priority for the state's administration under his leadership. Now, the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration, argues that the barrier violates the Federal Rivers and Harbor Act, anything that can pull out of a hat, right, and poses risks to human rights and the environment. This concerns highlights a broader debate over the legality and the ethics of such measures. And this court decision is not the final resolution, but allows the barrier to remain while further legal proceedings continue. This case reflects ongoing tensions between state and federal approaches to border security. You know what would fix this? A big, beautiful wall. A wall that works, that's Borders are closed, not wide open like they are technically down the street from border crossing Eagle Pass right now. Now, in related news, the New York State Supreme Court recently ruled against New York City Mayor Eric Adams' effort to stop Texas from busing illegal immigrants to the city, illustrating the national scope of the immigration issue. So, New York, New York, you can have all the illegals coming into Texas. You deal with it. Now, under the Biden and Harris administration, over 10 million illegal immigrants have entered the United States. That's less than four years. 10 million more people. Critics argue that the administration's policies are insufficient to control the situation, while supporters emphasize the need for com- comprehensive immigration reform. This situation remains a contentious issue within American politics, with states like Texas taking independent action to address border security concerns. Source of this is National Pulse, and this is also on GoRightNews.com. 
I'm going to tell you, we got to keep our border so secure. we got to keep our border secure. It's not about not wanting people to come in and not people wanting to immigrate. Even though it was up to me, I put a 20-year, 10, 20-year moratorium on immigration, case-by-case -case basis, secure our nation completely. Because that's the job of our nation is secure our borders. But, you know, they fail at it. Meanwhile, people suffer. Um, people can't get the medical needs that they desire because of all these extra unwanted people. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to reiterate, you support uh, the Medicare for All bill, I think initially co-sponsored co by Senator Bernie Sanders. You're also a co-sponsor yes. on, on it. I believe it will totally eliminate private insurance. Um, so for people out there who like their insurance, well, they don't get to keep it? Well, listen, the idea is that let's eliminate all of that. Let's move on. And moving on to Kamala Harris again. Kamala Harris's health care stance raises concerns among private insurance holders because Kamala Harris wants to eliminate private health care insurance. Now, as the United States approaches another crucial election period. It's essential to scrutinize the policy positions of candidates vying for leadership roles in our constitutional republic, such as Kamala Harris, a prominent figure in the Democratic Party who has sparked significant debate over her stance on health care, a critical issue for many American voters. During the 2020 presidential campaign, Harris made waves by expressing support for a Medicare for All bill introduced by Senator... Give me a moment. I'm Bernie Sanders. This proposal has drawn criticism from those who favor maintaining private health insurance options. In a CNN town hall with Jake Tapper, Harris confirmed her alignment with Sanders' vision when... Tapper questioned her about the potential elimination of private insurance under this plan. Harris responded, quote, well, listen, the idea that, <laughs> the, the idea that <laughs> everyone gets access to Medicare, <laughs> let's eliminate all that. Let's move on. So everybody doesn't get access to medical care because, under Harris? Let's just move on. <laughs> oh, you got to be kidding me. This response has been interpreted by the dismissal of approximately 200 million Americans who currently rely on private health care insurance. According to a recent survey, 68% of voters oppose the idea of ending private health care, highlighting a significant divide between Harris's proposals and public opinion. As Harris gears up for another potential run on her health care policy, uh, it remains elusive. To date, she has not provided specific details on her plans or engaged in public forums to discuss her proposals because she's running on airhead. That's what she's running on. Auto control. The absence of detailed policy outlines leaves many questions unanswered, particularly for those concerned about the future of private insurance. It's important to note that the interpretation of Harris's remarks and her implications for private insurance is a matter of ongoing debate. Critics argue that her position could lead to increased government control over health care. We don't need that. While supporters claim it aims to ensure universal access to medical services, hmm, there's nothing bad with that because I think, I personally think health care is a right. That's one thing that we should be waiting on. I don't believe in for-profit insurance. I think it's horrible that we're not trying to cure more diseases and eliminate people in hospitals. And as long as you keep it a profit, there's no incentive to fix things. Now, as the election season progresses, voters will likely seek more concrete information, we hope, on where Harris stands on this and other critical issues. Source of this is the Daily Wire. We also have this on GoRightNews.com. Joe Rogan destroying the liberal media for working to rewrite Kamala Harris's radical record. The podcaster warning that the media's anti-Trump agenda will give Kamala a huge boost to the ballot box. She's going to win. I feel like we are in this very bizarre time where people are giving in to the 
in a way that I, I never suspected people would before. And we this is this one, they just want no Trump, no matter what, and they're willing to gaslight themselves. She's the least popular vice president of all time. And then in a moment, a moment in time, all of a sudden she's our solution. She's our hero. Try Googling a negative story on her. You won't find one. It's I would have thought that Trump getting shot would like, that's it, election's over. But it's like, they no, no, no. memory hold that so quick. So Joe Rogan criticized the media's portrayal of Kamala Harris as the pseudo-cultural icon. Kamala Harris is not an icon. She's a disaster. Joe Rogan cuts in the heart of the Kamala Harris rebrand, and that's what it is. It's a rebrand. In a recent episode of his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, Joe Rogan discussed the media shift and portrayal of Vice President Kamala Harris's. You know, the transformation has been characterized as a strategic rebranding, repositioning of Harris as a cultural icon despite previous widespread criticism. Rogan, speaking with guest star Michael Malice, expressed skepticism about the sudden change in media narrative. He stated, Everybody forever was like, Kamala Harris is the worst vice president. She's the least popular vice president of all time. And then in a moment, in a moment of time, all of a sudden, she's our solution. Rogan continued, She's our hero. Everybody's with her. All of the social media posts about her, try Googling a negative story about her, and you won't find one. Ta-da! Yeah. Rogan's commentary suggests that this rebranding is part of a broader manipulation of public perception by the media. Just like half her family's Indian, half her family's uh, Jamaican. All of a sudden she went from being Indian to now she's black and they're making it like she's an african-american black and she graduated from a in you know a nationally black college and they're using that dei tactics to try to brainwash the black population to she's one of you vote for her she'll do well with you come on give it the chance no no It's manipulation by the media, which he implies undermines genuine democratic processes. Quote, it's not a real democracy. It's controlled parties. He concluded pointing to what he sees as a lack of authentic public discourse. Now, the remarks from Rogan underscore a viewpoint common among many moderate and conservative Republicans who are critical of perceived media bias and the manipulation of political narratives. This perspective aligns with the Constitutional Republic's principles emphasizing the importance of a free and unbiased press as a cornerstone of a functioning democracy. And it's important to note, it's important to note that Rogan's comments reflect his personal opinions and should not be considered and should should be considered as such. His assertions about the media's portrayal of Harris and the state of democracy highlight ongoing debates about media influence and political transparency in the United States. And that's brought to you by The Daily Wire, and that is also on GoRightNews.com. Experiencing record inflation, the worst in 30 years, way beyond expectations. OPEC didn't increase oil production. Can you tell us a little bit about how you would prevent the, the new spending and your Build Back Better agenda from exacerbating the problem? And also, what else are you going to do to fix this problem with inflation? Right, thank you. Well, let's start with this. Uh, prices have gone up. And families and individuals are dealing with the realities of, of the, that bread costs more, that gas costs more. And we have to understand what that means. That's about the cost of living going up. That's about having to stress 
and stretch limited resources. That's about a source of stress for families that is not only economic, but is on a daily level, something that is a heavy weight to carry. So it is something that we take very seriously. Um, but there is also a point that is important to make on the Build Back Better framework. One, it is designed to make it less expensive for working people to live. It was specifically designed to bring down the costs of childcare and increase accessibility and availability. Designed to bring down the cost of elder care. And make it available to all those working families that need that support and need that help. And Build Back Better is not gonna cost anything we're paying for it. <laughs> now let's give you the hashtag go right roundup. So today we've talked about Kamala Harris. That's going to be ongoing subjects. Um, Cause there's not much to talk about Biden unless he falls down the stairs or he does another crazy speech. They're going to keep Biden in the background. The hot, the spotlight is on Kamala Harris. Like they said, the polls are saying Kamala Harris is this, Kamala Harris is that. And yeah, I've given airtime to Kamala Harris, but like I've been saying, you have to point out, you have to get the information out there. And if the media will not downplay her, will not talk bad about her, they're only going to boost her. They're only going to boost her ratings and talk about how wonderful she is. They won't talk about how she only had 4% when she was running, 4% of popularity when she was running originally in the fold, that she dropped out before the actual primary. So she hasn't even voted on at all. She hasn't even been on a ballot, I don't think, for president. But yet she's now going to be the nominee. That says a lot for the democratic process. I know their candidate was bad. But people voted on that candidate. They waited till the 11th hour. They should have had her on the ballot. He should have dropped out. This takes away from a lot of other people who had the opportunity to come forward to run as a Democrat. Maybe a little bit more sensible people. Maybe a little bit more viable to go against Donald Trump. This also helps Donald Trump out. But we have to fight if you want Donald Trump to win. First, we have to make sure there's no more cheating going on. Two, we have to make sure that none of these 10 million or so illegal aliens who's gotten here in the last 10 years, or no, four years, less than four years, my bad, 10 million are not voting, that you have to be a, an American citizen and prove that you're voting, and we have to work on those measures locally and statewide and federal-wide. We have to make sure that only the right people are getting absentee ballots. We have to work the polls. We have to show up and make sure no hanky-panky is going on. Because our election was stolen in 2020. I don't care what YouTube thinks. I don't care. For a long time, I lost one of my YouTube channels for talking about this. And then they secretly let you go ahead and talk about it now. Because they know what's up. They'll say unfounded this, unfounded that, but it's, again, I brought up this. It's unfounded if you let the person who's supposed to honestly look over the information, to gatekeep the information, to secure the information. If that person is also the person doing the cheating and they erase their tracks, then there's nothing to see here. I made this illusion. If the murderer, if somebody murdered somebody, but they were also the investigation, they were the investigator of the murder, not only would they know how to remove the evidence, they would also be the one investigating the murder. And they would say nothing to see here. And they would give that to the media. And they would give that to the judge and the lawyers. And they would get rid and they would get away with murder. 
And that is how they got away with murdering our last election. By cheating. And I know a lot of crack pops and other things like that. And you had the whole QAnon movement and all that. And you had a lot of extra false information from both sides that really screwed up the information. And then you had the complications January 6th and everything. But we all know what happened, folks. We've been joking about the cheating from the Democratic Party for years and years. It's a joke. We all know about it. They joke about it. Talk about dead people voting, etc., etc., and the rolls not being closed and, you know, unacceptable votes. We've got to work on something. We have to work on that because... I mean, Donald Trump said the other day, vote for me now because there probably won't be any more voting after that. Yeah, you need to vote for me now because the whole system's gone to hell. We might not have a political system after four years. We don't know. The future is unwritten. The future is uncertain. And the future is up to you. And it's time for you to hashtag go right for America. Do right. Be right. And then maybe the country will be right. Have a good day. God bless. Peace.